Hey. Hello. So as you know, I am deep undercover in corporate America. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know you if are. that's accurate, but it's not undercover, but it's I'm in the belly of the beast. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> that's better. <laughs> Uh, but I do feel like I'm undercover because I've gotten this comment a few times now at work. Whenever I do like a presentation or something, or I just, mm -hmm. I am speaking for an extended amount of time, people will be like, you have a great voice. You should do a podcast. <laughs> 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 and I just have to be like, yeah, uh -huh, yeah that'd be cool. <laughs> Wouldn't that be weird? <laughs> that'd yeah. be crazy. Uh, I've actually gotten that before in my, one of my evaluators said that because when we did remote learning. Or oh, yeah, yeah. It was like, I could, I could listen to, you know, your class or whatever. I could listen to that, like on a podcast or something. Uh, <laughs> that would be weird. Yeah, crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I go with, um, oh, yeah, I, I thought about it, <laughs> yeah. which is true. <laughs> I thought about it and carried it out. And I did it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what are we doing today with our great podcast voices? Yours is still recovering. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. If any coughs make it through the editing process, that's why. I will do my best to cut them out. But hopefully now I sound like a normal person anyway. You're getting there. <laughs> I was doing my Chucky on Rugrats impression <laughs> earlier this week. Oh, remember that one episode where he like got better and it was so weird? Yeah. That was so <laughs> sad. All right. Uh, today we're going to be learning about Labor Day since when we're recording this, we're on Labor Day weekend in the United States. We are. We are. I'm going to use my Labor Day to edit this podcast. <laughs> there you go. Laboring for the people. Yeah, yeah. Day. The good kind. <laughs> so, yeah, we'll kind of cover the basics of like how it became a holiday, kind of the background mm -hmm. to that, too, and everything. Like it gets into kind of like the labor history of the United States and stuff like that. Um, which we could do a deeper dive on later. For sure. And then kind of uh, we'll, we'll compare that to large parts of the rest of the world that do Labor Day differently. Oh, okay. Yeah. I would love that. Like I've been seeing a lot of takes right now about how, I mean, Labor Day is a white collar ho holiday. Like, <laughs> you know, like service industry doesn't get off and they do most of the labor in this country. Like it's fucking insane. Very true. Very true. And we'll kind of get into that as well like why that is yeah all right take me away all right so let's start uh the story of labor day with its origins how did it come to be yeah what happened and was there a guy named johnny labor <laughs> no but there were two guys with very similar names oh okay that it's it's kind of disputed which of these two men actually was the first person to propose labor day being a national holiday okay uh both of them were in kind of uh, either the same or kind of affiliated labor unions uh, and depending on the story you hear and and they both are purported to have proposed it at a meeting of that union in May of 1882. So the union in question was called the Central Labor Union of New York City. Uh, it was a Marxist labor union organized in 1867. Was this featured on one of our like early socialist parties episode or no? Uh, it wasn't specifically, but okay. that's the time period we're talking about. Okay, cool. There was the, uh, you're, you're thinking of the... Uh, I'm thinking of the Communist Club, I think. The Communist Club, yes. Yeah, it's just a good name. It was centered in New York, and I think that was started in the 50s. Yeah. Uh, sorry, the 1850s. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta be careful. Which I guess they used to refer to them as the 50s. Yeah, maybe. I was reading I don't know, some fucking tweet or something, and someone was referring to the 90s, but it was the <laughs> And I was like, they called what? those the gay 90s. Love that. <laughs> yeah, they must have been fantastic. Yeah, sounds great. So the secretary of the Central Labor Union was a guy named Matthew McGuire. He was its secretary and he, one story goes, proposed the idea of a Labor Day holiday on the first Monday of each September to commemorate this parade that they had in New York City that year. Basically, just like, let's do this every year. Let's make it an annual thing. Wait, so he was commemorating, which the parade had already happened like the year before or something? Or what are we talking about? Uh, they they were planning it later that year. And then he was like, and then from then on, let's just like make this a national holiday. Okay, let's gotcha, let's gotcha. always get the day off for this. Cool. Uh, and on the, the other hand, your other story is a guy named Peter McGuire. <laughs> okay. Uh, who was the co-founder of the United Brotherhood of Carpenters and Joiners of America. And he was also vice president of the AFL, the American Federation of Labor. 
So he was a big union leader guy. Uh, and he was at this meeting too. And maybe he was the one who said, let's have, you know, a general holiday for the laboring classes. And also said like, let's do a big parade. Let's show solidarity. And then let's like host a picnic afterwards, sell tickets, do kind of a fundraiser for our union sort of thing. So those are kind of the two origin stories in terms of who specifically thought it up with the first Monday in September being seen as kind of a good midpoint uh, between kind of the July 4th and Thanksgiving. Just, you know, it's been a while since we've had a holiday. Do you think the secretary guy, Mugwire, just like accidentally misspelled that guy's name in the meetings notes and was like, it was my idea. <laughs> <laughs> I totally did it. Yeah. No, uh, there's a, there's apparently, you know, uh, adherence to both sides of the story. McGuire, Peter McGuire was the long time understood to be the guy, but then like later they go back and they're like, I don't know, maybe it was Matthew Mugwire. Who knows? <laughs> so silly. But yeah, that's not so, like that long ago that we wouldn't just know. Like, I just think that's funny. <laughs> it's just because uh, you don't have as good records, I guess. I guess you have yeah. meetings, notes from the meeting, basically. But nobody knew that this was going to be no that deal. anyone was going to care. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, uh, Labor Day kind of catches on gradually at the local and state level. Uh, Oregon is the first state to make it a public holiday in 1887. And then by 1894, 30 states had followed suit. And that year, the president, Grover Cleveland, made it an official federal holiday, too. I wouldn't expect that from Grover Cleveland. He doesn't seem like the Labor Day type. I don't think so. No, I mean, he was generally just kind of a reformer Democrat. Okay, like, okay. He was a Gilded Age. He was no big labor activist. <laughs> but we'll talk about why he did that. Okay. So, all right, that's the big picture thing. We want to get into, though, why did they do these things? Did mm -hmm. they just wake up one day and think, oh, I need a day off, right? <laughs> I mean, that's a good enough reason for me. <laughs> well, the backstory kind of involves the history of labor unions in the United States, uh, which start taking off in the mid-1800s, around the same time as uh, cool ideological currents like socialism, mm. communism, as those start growing in the U.S. Our, our episode on the history of socialist parties, the part one, covers kind of some of that. That is episode 17, if you want to go back in the archives and check that out. That seems like so long ago. I know. I feel like old, <laughs> which is weird. <laughs> uh, so you see, start to see the rise of these, you know, Marxist intellectual currents and labor organizing alongside it. And so labor unions start sprouting up all over the place. It's not just like an ideological thing, though. It's also in response to the material conditions because capitalism is, you know, getting into its industrial phase and everything like it's it's growing. The industrial revolution is in full swing and more and more workers find themselves, you know, exploited down to the bone uh, and they turn to each other, you know, for strength and numbers, for solidarity to try to help themselves out of that situation. Yeah. I mean, this is the time when like child labor is really prevalent and mm -hmm. like you have like workplace accidents all the fucking time. And like, it's just yes. really terrible, yeah. terrible conditions for everybody. Yeah. And so, yeah, we don't want to leave anyone with the impression because we're not idealist in that sense that people came up with some good ideas and started doing it. <laughs> guys, they were what if we you know, sensibly. This? Yeah. They were sensibly reacting to and, doing things in response to the material conditions that were happening. So. Yeah, because when you look at it from that perspective, you can't just like ask your boss like, hey, like a lot of kids are dying in these tiny machines. Maybe could you not do that? Mm -hmm. Like that's not going to work because he's going to be like, well, those kids are making me a fuck ton of money. There's no <laughs> law. There's no law that says don't. So I'm going to. And that's yeah. just like how their brains work. Mm -hmm. They're pathological. Not on an individual level, but like in their social role. They like are they, required to. Like that is, yeah. they are obligated to their shareholders or whatever to do whatever it takes to make more money. Yep. And, it, you know, okay, raise the argument. Well, what about privately held? 
they don't have shareholders, but they're obligated by their desire to stay in the market <laughs> to yeah. do these things. Yeah, know? if their competition is all using child labor, like they're going to fucking use child labor. Mm -hmm. See fast fashion, yep. still doing it. <laughs> yeah. And that goes the same with low wages, with whatever. Yep. Anyway, that's the environment we see the rise of labor unions starting to occur in, and they start to kind of unite together into larger and larger unions like the Knights of Labor, which was organized in 1869. Still a kick-ass name. <laughs> it is, yeah. Uh, and into federations of labor unions like the American Federation of Labor, which was formed in 1881. Oh, so that's like actually made up of several different unions? Like, a, I mean, it's a federation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like local labor unions. And obviously, the masters of capitalism, when faced with this challenge, they were just like, you know, gee, I guess like you guys are right. We were being a little bit mean. <laughs> you know, here's some extra pay. Here's some benefits. Oh, uh, for sure. Sorry. Right. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure that's exactly what happened. <laughs> yeah. Uh, if only, if only they instead uh, dug in their heels, you know, resorted to whatever means necessary to get, you know, to leech the labor from their workforce that they felt they were entitled to. And so you start to see the big labor conflicts of the 1800s, uh, strikes, violence. There's more than 37,000 strikes in America between 1881 and 1905. Jesus. So tons and tons of That's a lot. strikes that are, yeah, that's, this is the time period we're talking about then. Okay. So Tons of labor actions going on, labor unions growing, capital's like, fuck that, they're fighting back. That's the world we're in when worker power seems to kind of be ascendant, you know? Just, it's a completely different world than the world we're in now. <laughs> yeah. So this is like the time of like the Pinkertons and shit, right? Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. What are those? Those are just, that was like a special police squad or something, like a private police they were yeah a private detective agency uh that was oftentimes used as just you know what they would call in harlan county gun thugs yeah uh, detective implies like they're solving crimes but the crime is like unions so. <laughs> yes yeah and the solution was guns yeah or, uh, baseball bats <laughs> they're not something. like solving murders yeah they're doing the murders <laughs> I mean, they're solving it too. Like, yeah, I did that one. <laughs> that one's <laughs> that me. That was me. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that's where we're at when people are saying, hey, let's do a labor holiday. Another important kind of part of this backstory is something we've talked about on the show before, the Haymarket affair. Oh, yeah. Was that the one where there was like a panic and then, oh, I don't remember. <laughs> I, I realized this morning, I was like, because I'm listening to an audiobook for a future episode and I keep zoning out and I'm like, wow, I'm really a visual learner. And I'm like, fuck, I do a, f a fucking podcast. Like, that's not great. I hope other people don't zone out. But yeah, I know there's a panic and Emma Goldman was pissed about this and mm -hmm. people got shot. <laughs> Christine's history lesson. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's, you know, that's part of it. So... Well, we, nowadays we would call this an officer involved shooting because uh, <laughs> the cops started gunning people down. This was in 1886 in Chicago. And the whole thing starts when the AFL, the American Federation of Labor, they did a general strike. Mm. They called for a general strike like nationwide on May 1st, 1886. May Day. In support of the eight hour workday. Well, it wasn't May Day yet. Oh, okay. Like the traditional sort of like springtime festival it was, but not like International Workers Day or anything. It wasn't yet. Uh, but this is where that origin story comes from. Uh, they, up to half a million workers nationwide went on strike and there's like 40,000 of them doing that in Chicago. Shit. And this eventually escalates when the police show up to this demonstration and somebody throws a bomb and it blows up. It kills a cop and uh, hurts a whole bunch of people around it. And then the cops just, this is the one where they just started shooting themselves and other people. <laughs> There's a lot of those. Yeah. It was chaos. And they were just like, I mean, like I said, they, they wounded a bunch of each other. On Jesus. That. 
uh, and they were just firing like crazy. And people, you know, people are killed by that today and wounded by that. And eventually they have a show trial afterwards uh, where uh, five workers end up either executed or committing suicide in Oof. jail awaiting execution uh, because of this. You know, they were just trying to put anarchists uh, in jail for that. Fuck. But eventually uh, the AFL wanted to try again. They still hadn't gotten the eight hour workday. And so they do it on the anniversary of the last attempt after they've kind of regrouped for a while. So it's May 1st, 1890 this time. Uh, they're like, let's do another general strike. And I bet like the reaction to that was a lot of like blaming the strikers and shit and mm -hmm. being like, well, they killed a cop. Well, they did all this. So let's not give them the eight hour work day, you know? Yeah. Yeah. These are, these are anarchists, lawbreakers, terrorists, that sort of thing. So, so they announced that I think in 1888, they, that they're going to do that. They're going to plan for it. Uh, in 1889, their president, a guy named Samuel Gompers writes to the second international, which is the, that's like, like the Soviet Union, right? Well, well, it's not their the Soviet club. Union yet. Okay. It's, oh um, yes. Yeah, shit. <laughs> this is a, just the socialists, uh, of the world. Basically. Okay. Yes. Yes. And he tells them, look, Hey, this is what we're planning we propose that maybe you guys want to team up too. Uh, we can do this internationally fight around the world for an eight hour day, starting on May 1st, 1890. And they say, that sounds like a really good idea. Let's do that. Love it. So they do that as kind of a, a global solidarity for the eight hour workday. And also uh, to commemorate the martyrs of the Haymarket affair. And this is the first, May Day, the first International Workers Day. This is uh, so May first, eighteen ninety, and it becomes an annual event. You know, it's just, it's all about you know workers' rights, labor unions, socialism, communism. Uh, over time, it's become more ceremonial and everything, uh, but in general, it retains more of that like focus on on workers and labor and stuff. Yeah, yeah, like we don't really celebrate May Day in the States, but like other places do, right? Because it like started here and like that's kind of crazy that we don't recognize it. Like I assumed it started in Russia. <laughs> and yeah, it seems like it would it would be since the rest of the world does it and we don't that yeah, it would have started somewhere else. But um, it's it's so it's interesting like, okay, why is there that disparity? So let's get back to the Labor Day versus May Day thing. Basically, they proposed Labor Day, we said in 1882 doesn't become official till 1894 and it doesn't follow that may international workers day it's in september all right so the reason it happens in 1894 is something called the pullman strike which we've also talked about in that history of socialist parties episode okay that one is i don't remember that one at all i'm not gonna lie no worries. It's been Tell a while. Like it. we said, it's been a long time. It's been so, a long time. Uh, this one was where the American Railway Union was on strike. Uh, they, they, they had a company town there that uh, all of a sudden they started raising rents and utilities mm, and stuff, but yeah. like cutting pay. And they're just like, well, we're going to die well, if you do that. that. So they're on strike. And this is the one where friend of the show, Eugene Debs. I love that guy. Was the leader of the union there. And the government called in troops and mowed down the strikers, killing like 30 of them and wounding 57 of them. Don't love that. Yeah. And that was President Cleveland <laughs> okay. who had ordered them in. And so kind of after, after wreaking all that havoc, he kind of had to give a sorry, I killed a lot of you gesture. And it was Labor Day? And so, yeah, uh, organized <laughs> labor was, you know, super pissed and he kind of wanted to mollify them somewhat. Wow. And I mean, by that point, he kind of had to choose because 1890 had already rolled around. So he kind of has to choose. Okay, well, originally they were kind of asking for September. These are kind of more of the moderate voices. And then you know, now you got all these socialist communist anarchists asking for May Day for the international work. I'm not going to do that because I mean, like <laughs> Cleveland, he's trying to apologize, but he's not a Marxist. Like, yeah, so, yeah. Uh, so he went with September. Okay. Okay. Interesting. And so that's why we end up with a different holiday than most of the world. There are other places that also don't do it on May mm -hmm. 1st, but. Interesting. I mean, this is a bloody fucking holiday. Like we don't, 
we don't know that. Like, we don't talk about that. Like, I mean, mm-hmm. America loves a good martyr story. <laughs> you know, yeah. we love to talk about people shed their blood for this, and blah, 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 blah. But not this one. This one's just like, ah, oh, have a barbecue. It's fine. <laughs> well, and the reason is who do they shed their blood against? You know, we're exactly. happy to celebrate people. Oh, you know, they died over there bombing Iraqis in Afghanistan mm-hmm. and, and in Afghans because. Because you know, women's died rights, our, obviously. Yeah, and to protect our freedoms here, which were under threat somehow. I Yeah, I uh, don't know how that works, but okay. Yeah, and that's, you know, oh, let's remember the people mm-hmm. who shed their blood. But when they're, when they're dying because the government is killing them because they're asking for workers' rights and standing up and demanding it, then, yeah. Well, that's a problem. Ooh, what? What? Go shopping, please. <laughs> yeah, go check out these sales. Get a mattress. Yeah. <laughs> that's kind of the origin story. Like that's why it happens in 1894 is because we're, you know, we're trying to calm everyone down from labor unrest by giving mm-hmm. them a day off. Wow. And that's why it happens in September instead of May is because we don't want to be too. <laughs> Can't be too communist. communist. We don't wow. want to commemorate, you know, people killing cops. When in the year did the Pullman strike happen? Cause what, if it was after May, I could also see it being like, well, we missed May guys. Yeah, it was Okay. May 11th to July 20th. So they, they would have to wait a whole year, to be fair. Oh, uh, yeah. That's not going to kick in fast enough to calm people down. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe that's... I'm not I'm not going to die defending fucking you're Grover a, Cleveland. You're a Grover Cleveland apologist. <laughs> <laughs> that's me. You know, I love the Cleve. Hey, he was kind of... He, he was not swash. good. He was not good, but he, he had some swag. We've established there are no good presidents. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 100%. See the one... No, that's Taft. Or no, which one went twice? Was that Grover Cleveland? That's Grover Cleveland, <laughs> yeah. Okay, I think we might have told this story before. With the flu- <laughs> <laughs> we, we had a presidential placemat growing up, and that's why Grady knows most of the order of the presidents pretty well. <laughs> I apparently didn't pay attention. or No, I hogged the placement. Yeah, you liked that one. I think I got the world map instead. I, I didn't learn anything from it, but I had it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but on there, they had Grover Cleveland and then the other guy. And then Grover Cleveland, same picture, but it was flipped, flipped like horizontally. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway. <laughs> so there you go. Uh, there are other places, like we said, that have different labor holidays, if you want to know a few of those kind of weird ones. I do. Uh, Canada more or less followed our trajectory. They had labor demonstrations. And actually, the guys who were organizing that first parade in New York City that kind of kicked this stuff off were kind of inspired by labor demonstrations in Canada of the same vein. And they were like, oh, that would be cool. Then their government made it official in 1894. So kind of like similar to our story, but with less, uh, with less like strikes and, and, and and blood and shit. Okay. So they, they do September, they do Labor Day. Yes. They do a September date of some sort. Uh, New Zealand, theirs is in October. It's to commemorate this guy, uh, this cool dude named Samuel Parnell. He was a carpenter. Lots of carpenters in this. I bet being a carpenter is physically hard. You only want to work eight hours a day. He, that's what he basically said. He was like, I ain't working longer than eight hours a day. And he convinced other people in New Zealand to do that too. Basically, they just refused to work more than eight hours a day. And, you know, eventually the government was like, uh, okay, I guess. Then sure, we <laughs> sure, have an eight hour work day. Jeez. Since you guys are already doing that. So that was a direct action, getting the good sort of thing. Uh, that was in 1840. Amazing sideburns on this man. <laughs> just, wow. Uh, next in the Bahamas, it's on the first Friday in June. That's to commemorate a strike against unfair wages. The British were like building this military base in World War II. This is in 1942. Uh, and they were like paying american workers to come down and they were paying them like twice as much as they were paying the local workers there and they were like what the fuck you know so they start started a protest that was called the burma road riot and when they set up labor day they set it on that date to commemorate it cool who else do we have trinidad and tobago uh this is on june 19th Theirs is also to commemorate a strike, a different one. This is led by Tubal Uriah Butler in 1937. Uh, in Jamaica, you have May 24th, which used to be Empire Day, which sounds really shitty. It sounds terrible. It's like my least favorite holiday. <laughs> yeah, fuck that. It's like a like a patriotic, you know, isn't it great to be part of the British Empire? Oh, no. Uh, 
But by 1961, when they were no longer part of the British Empire, they were like, that's got to go. Uh, <laughs> yeah. We're not celebrating that. Fuck so they no. changed it to Labor Day. The, uh, the date, May 24th, commemorated a labor rebellion that they had in 1938, uh, which kind of started their whole road to independence, road to kind of nationalism and, and, and breaking free uh, of the British Empire. That's a glow up right there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> From Empire Day to Labor Day slash like independence. Pretty good. Pretty good stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Japan has uh, Labor Thanksgiving Day. They've had this since 1848, which is like a blend of like a traditional kind of Thanksgiving harvest festival oh. feel plus celebrating workers labor. It's not like uh, union oriented. The unions there still do like May Day stuff, but it's just, you know, let's appreciate that people do work and, and contribute to society and stuff. That's just like a more mindful Thanksgiving, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's good. In Australia, it's an interesting story because they're all over the place in terms of their, it's just state by state. They each have a different Labor Day <laughs> holiday. Sweet. Which New Zealand used to do until people started complaining that the sailors were getting like six, 10 days off because they would just go to different ports <laughs> and they'd be like, oh, it's Labor Day, you know, like I'm not working. <laughs> that is a great scam. I love that. Shout out to you New Zealanders. That's great. <laughs> well, Australia apparently is still, you know, doing this. I guess you can't really <laughs> sail around to the different states. Okay. No, no. If you're in Australia and you listen to our show and you work remotely, just say you're moving every few months and be like, sorry, mm -hmm. guys, it's Labor Day here. <laughs> I can't do it. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> That's a good plan. <laughs> There's stems from their own local, you know, like all these kind of have their own local story. And theirs is some of them are on May 1st. Some of them are in, in different months, but they're uh, in Melbourne. I believe it's stemming from their own eight hour day campaign, which was in 1856. The bunch of stonemasons also hard work. Uh, they go on strike and they're trying to get an eight hour day and all of them just fucking quit building this this old building for a, one of the universities there or mm. something. And the government was just like, like, fine, we'll pay you the same eight hour day, whatever, please get back to work. And I mean, yeah, they just, they just won an eight hour day by striking. I mean, I, I talked about this on my Instagram one day, but like, let's talk about an eight hour, eight hour work day. Like, okay. to me, that's too many hours. <laughs> oh yeah. 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 Now, nowadays it's, it's too much. Like a four hour work day would be, what we need to be fighting for. I feel like I am only productive for four hours. And like, I think that's okay. Especially like my kind of job where it's like, you know, creative, you're sitting down, it's fine. Yeah. Especially if you're in a physical job and you expect to be moving the entire time for eight hours. Like what the fuck? Like that's, and the, and to think by the fact that like people used to work way more than that, like they yes. had to fight yeah. for this because this was a thing. Like I can't uh -huh. imagine. And now we think it's just normal. Mm -hmm. But this was like a hard won concession that they, yeah, like you said, they had to fight for to get. And now we can see like, yeah, we would like to work less, but they were, you know, think how, how many, they were working 12 hour days and stuff. Like they're just trying to get down to something civilized, Jesus, sort of, but now and we're ours like, is not civilized. <laughs> right. Yeah. Now we're like, this isn't good either. <laughs> yeah. And, and that's, I think what's frustrating about working in like an office environment is that like everyone else feels this way too but no one wants to admit it <laughs> you know like there's a, a culture of fear around it like no i'm totally mm -hmm. online the entire time and working very hard i'm like no you're not like i know you're not like right no but way. everyone wants to feel like or be seen at least to be crucially contributing all the time because otherwise it's not well let me let you off for the same amount of pay because you don't have the power it's the boss saying well why don't i pay you less or cut your hours or fire you, you know? I mean, I, I think I have talked about this before too. Like I work very quickly. So it's really frustrating for me to even be on a clock at all. Cause I'm just like, it doesn't matter if I get my work done. I do what you ask of me. What am I supposed to do? Mm -hmm. Make my own work? Like just make up shit to do. <laughs> like, that's, that's stupid. Yep. I mean, ultimately it comes down to, we need more power for workers. Uh, we, we, workers have to have the leverage. And that's one of the things that, you know, employers are bitching about so much lately. Mm -hmm. 
globally. I mean, not just here in the States, but you see this, you know, they have a shortage of lorry drivers in the UK, all over the place. They, they, it's, 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 they don't feel like they have the power over workers that they used to because of the tight labor market, you know, and they're not willing to pony over more money. They want to, they want people to, you know, want to work, want to Ugh. come in and get exploited. Ugh, who does that? Which, I mean, people don't have like an innate antipathy toward work as a concept. I don't mean that, like the, no, oh, people no. are just lazy. No. But working for some other asshole to take money from you. That's the thing. It's like, are you really that passionate about like accounting or whatever the fuck it is? Or, you know, or in yeah. the service industry case, or like, are you like, is this your fucking dream is to be like physically exploited for several hours a day and never get a day off and like all this like horrible labor treatment like no yeah. nobody's passionate about that and if you are mm -hmm. i'm worried about you even with service industry you know you might have a passion for helping people and for absolutely you know yeah like the service part or the relationship part or whatever yeah yeah like and again that's you're doing I mean. tangible work and that's good yeah. and that should uh -huh. be respected more and like you can genuinely enjoy it but like the the way the market works is you are going to be treated like fucking shit yeah, so like, you're going to be exploited yeah. from, from that and alienated from it. You know, like it's the whole, the, the example I like to use from that is like, if you like just anything you love to do, if you love to play piano, but then you like had to work, you, you were working at the piano playing factory and you have to show <laughs> up and play piano for a certain amount of time and somebody, you know, pays you a little bit and then makes a bunch of money off of you playing. Like you would start to hate that, even though it's something you love. Yeah, I mean, like, as, like, an artist and people who, like, I'm friends with artists, like, that's a thing. Like, I mm -hmm. love making comics, but, like, I have to also contend with the realities of, like, keeping up an audience on social media and, like, making sure I post often enough and, like, all this bullshit that I only have to do because of capitalism. And, and same thing with music. Like, I have a friend who, like, is a musician and, like you end up having to take jobs with people you don't want to work with. Like, oh, this conductor is really shitty, but it's like, I got to do it. Like, I don't have an option. Even, even shit you enjoy. Capitalism sucks. <laughs> Capitalism sucks. That is that's the name of the game here. Yeah. I think the Trailbillies mentioned this too, but do you think the labor market like shortage is a little bit because like a lot of people died? Good point. It could be. It's not, they're, they're not staggering numbers, are they? Like... In terms I don't know. Of, it's not like the Black Death or something. <laughs> well, fuck. Uh, well, that, that took out like a third of you know Europe yeah. or something. Well, and didn't their labor but, market <clears throat> change from that yeah. too? Like that's why we have like guilds and shit. Mm -hmm. uh, it, had. All of a sudden, <laughs> I'm in the guild. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have WoW guilds and stuff now because of that. <laughs> uh, but you had like a massive shortage. Uh, yeah, a labor shortage, and like peasants were able to be like, "Hey, don't treat us so shitty. You know, we're not going to take that anymore." Yeah, there's only like so that. much of us. You can't just go get another peasant. Right. Yeah. That's so interesting. Um, and I mean, there's got to be some part of that. Uh, I I feel like somewhat it was a mask off event, not masks like for safety, <laughs> but I mean like capitalism showed you. That it was willing to just throw you in the wood chipper to continue to make money. You yeah, know? yeah, and they basically said it, and it was very, very obvious. I mean, still is. Like the machine is still going, guys. We're we're sending children to school where now yeah. children are more susceptible than ever. It's pretty fucked up. Uh, yeah, and I just, you know, I'm sure a, lot, a large number of people who kind of. Felt, I don't know, felt valued, but, you know, didn't, didn't think that, you know, they felt there was some sort of a contract, some sort of a implicit agreement. I do my part. My employer does their part, you know, kind of a collaborationist idea mm -hmm. of society working together in these different roles that, you know, the, 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 the pandemic revealed that, like, that is a not the case. It's a mm -hmm. one way street of you show up, you take the terms and you. Uh, and you're grateful for it. Yeah. <laughs> And people were, you know, who could were like, I'm, I'm not doing that anymore. You know? Well, I think it's interesting too. Like you already see people abstracting this concept. Like I haven't seen a lot of pieces that make that point of like, Hey, maybe it's because people died and we have fewer people. And instead I'm seeing lots of stuff mm -hmm. like our supply chain is super fucked up. Like I wonder why. And it's like, mm, maybe it's cause like factory workers are treated very poorly and like they're starting to strike and like, you know, 
Like, it's all about, like, complaining. Like, the, the price of lumber is too high and, like, gas is too high. And you're like, okay, let's talk about why. And it's also, yeah, I think it's a, a good point to bring up is it's also on our, like, mm, from the perspective of the Imperial Corps, like, we can't get cars or computer <laughs> chips Microchips, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, graphics processors and stuff. And it's like, well, we can't get those things because of a shortage in the supply chain, which means it's further down. So you're talking like rare earth minerals, which are miners and shit who, you know, I mean, it very well could be that like a large portions of them are, are dead. Probably. Cause we're not fucking sharing our vaccines. Yeah. Like this is the unvaccinated uh, swaths of the world who are slated to get that whenever, because no one's prioritizing that. Yeah. Like we're only looking at it from the Americans perspective, but that's true. That's a great point. Yeah, if you look further down. Mm. Uh, <laughs> All right, back to Labor Day. Dismal. <laughs> back to Labor Day. All right. I guess let's talk about kind of its importance over time or its kind of changing role. If you look early on, you know, when they had those parades. I'd love a labor parade. This one's great. Well, they were very like explicitly, it was very, it was explicitly a working class oriented holiday it was to celebrate working people it wasn't abstracted out to nothingness now it's just i don't know it's a day off uh, you know um you had large public demonstrations and celebrations that were actually organized by these large and ever-growing labor unions so like there was a big public presence to that uh, a understanding that was unavoidable that you know, this was a holiday to commemorate the hard work that organized labor had put in to bettering the plight of the working people in our country. It almost reminds me of like, I mean, not this at all, but like a company picnic sort of thing of like, hey, like it's sponsored, it's sponsored by these labor unions mm -hmm. who like yeah. did cool shit for you and, and hopefully you support them back. Like it's, it, that sounds really cool. Yeah. Like. It wasn't so much about like just shopping <laughs> and stuff. I did go uh, shopping yesterday. That's that's my bad. <laughs> well, that's you know, it's it was the weekend, so it's not it's not like I know, didn't realize it until I was out. I was like, oh shit, it might be crowded. <laughs> uh, so I, I don't know. In the one sense, I think one big change is like anything in the U.S., it gets commercialized over time, <laughs> uh, and I, I think this is an interesting trend. Like, it's part of capital's search it's perpetual search for more markets and not just in the physical sense of well we need more people to sell stuff to but even to those people we need to carve out more time or more like marketable opportunities for us to make profit off of them or convince them to generate profit for us okay explain so like think the gig economy is a good example of this your free time why don't you hustle for and drive for Uber or Lyft or sell yeah. something on Etsy? Like that eight hours for what you will, you know, eight hours for rest, eight hours for work, eight hours for what you will. That part is now is like a new frontier for capital. That's they're, they're trying to get in any way they can and, and monetize that and extract, extract profit from you, even in your free time. Yeah. And that goes both ways too. Like they can both, try to get you to hustle and they can also use like your desire to have more free time to like sell like convenience products too. So they can be like, Oh, do you not have time? Cause you have a side hustle? Like here, like take this like pre-made meal situation. Very good point. Cause in that, like they have another, they've built another thing, they built <laughs> another so widget busy where, for some yeah. reason. <laughs> they built another box and they put some people in there and they, Ugh, it's just an in out, uh, profit machine, you know, yeah. at more advertisements to monetize our, our leisure time. If we're just watching videos or whatever, you know, that's that there's more ways to capitalize on that. And, our, and here, I think even our, our days off of work, our holidays and stuff, whatever those days are, are more and more geared toward repurposed toward consumption. Yeah, for sure. Think about our cultural holidays that used to be more traditionally like family and loved ones focused or just, or even religiously focused, which you don't have to be, but like mm -hmm. whatever they were or spiritual or how, what have you, 
they were not like crassly consumerist, you know, <laughs> like Christmas or a Yule or whatever, or, or Halloween and stuff like these used to have a different significance than they more increasingly have now, which is what is, you know, what should I buy for this thing? <laughs> what should I consume? I feel like you see that more and more now. Like there's just a proliferation of, of both like the intent to sell things and also like stupid holidays like you know like whenever they're like it's national dog day or yeah national <laughs> avocado day yeah yeah all this bullshit like it's just we're just obsessed like always be selling <laughs> yes uh-huh and it's not i guess i don't mean to flip this and say you're an asshole for buying no. things like Whatever. it's not your fault yeah it's we and we can't change things by saying oh i vow not to <laughs> buy stuff, buy gifts for people or what, like, that's not the point. The point is what capital is doing to, to find more ways to rip you off, you know, and it's just, we need to be fighting them. And the, the, the way isn't by just like not consuming, that's not very helpful. It's not going to really. do anything. It's by mass action, you know? And I think too, even if you look at what you think of when you think of just generic Labor Day without any historical context, you're just like, okay, that is, people use it as their last chance to take a summer vacation. Like that's super mm -hmm. common because you have an extra day off, which that's a consumer product for sure. They use it. I mean, there's sales, which you already talked about. They're, even like the, <laughs> the don't wear white after Labor Day, that kind of implies like you might need to go buy some new clothes, you know, like mm, yeah. having a party, like a barbecue, like that's money for sure. And like, mm -hmm. again, it's not like you can't do any of these things. Uh, yeah, we're not know. saying don't have fun. That's no, <laughs> no fun all. allowed in the commune. <laughs> My point is that we went from a straight up union backed holiday to like mm -hmm. buy all this shit and don't think about the unions. <laughs> and that's interesting too. Yeah. Cause that's a shift from a communal, a community sort of bonding with your fellow people uh, to the, and, and it's not to say people don't do social events, but they do it on an individual scale. Like it's much smaller. Yeah. I mean, you might have a neighborhood block party and stuff, but even those are, I think kind of declining in favor of, I mean, everyone's so atomized, you know, everyone's so, yeah. on, they're on their island, they're afraid of their neighbors, and we don't do any of that, which I'm a super introvert, so I'm really, <laughs> you know, I'm judging the specs in other people's eyes when I've got a log in my own, but, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I don't know, I think that that's, that's part of it too, is, is more atomization, is what I mean. Yeah, yeah, and I think you see that with other holidays too. We went from Christmas carolers out in the street and shit like that to like, it is all very in the home. Yeah. You ever see that in an old Christmas movie and you're like, Oh, that's weird. Why yeah. I would never open my door to like a gang of strangers <laughs> <laughs> in the middle of the night. <laughs> another thing, another point kind of in this vein is the decline of labor unions, like involvement in this kind of mirrors their, the labor union rates plummeting the rate of unionization or unionization density, whew, you, you don't think about labor unions as much. They're not as visible in people's communities. You, you, don't, you don't know about them because they're declining in numbers. It's uh, 1954, nearly 35% of American workers were in a union. By the 1980s, we're looking at 20%. Now we're around 10%. Oh my God. Oh, we are watching... We didn't finish it because it was boring. <laughs> we were watching and this is like a little, little HBO mini doc series uh, about elections. And uh -huh. it's just like famous elections. And it was Ford versus Reagan. <laughs> and Kyle and I were both talking. I was like, you know, that would be a really good time machine murder is Reagan. That'd be a good one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Reagan's an asshole. Uh, we have to do an episode on him and our crimes of capitalism ones. He's At some point, worst. he's a piece of shit. He really was the proto-Trump. Yeah, yeah, in many ways. Yeah. So, I don't know, labor unions getting weaker like that, losing members, right? They have less money, less resources to devote to just looking up for the members that they still have, let alone doing these wider things in the community. So, that I don't know, that's that's something you see there. And it's not to say that they're being dumb for not doing these things. I get no. it. They don't have the material resources to do it on that scale. I think that these parades and the picnics, you mentioned it earlier, it like gets people kind of on your side. It's, it's a it's positive kinda, association. Yeah. Yeah. It's, 
you know, sponsored by the union, but like it's <laughs> not just recruitment of direct members, but a big part of when you do labor actions and stuff is having the broader community. You, you want it to be everybody versus your boss. Yes. Not you just your public union. support. Yeah. You want everyone out there, everyone helping each other to, I mean, basically to shame and, you know, intimidate this guy into, into breaking and into, into, into giving into your demands, you know? Well, I think you could look at this and just be like, all right, well, why did they fall? Like, did everyone just wake up and say, no, unions are a bad idea. Like, there's a reason behind that too, right? Yeah. I mean, we covered that in our, in our right to work state episode. I mean, they changed laws, you know, and they made it easier to bust unions. Essentially, we went from a regime where the national laws of the U.S. were from the 30s, really till the 80s, were broadly either pro or at least neutral on the labor question. And when you start to see the shift to neoliberalism in like the 70s is when unionization rates start plummeting. And that's there's a big complicated story behind it. But, uh, you know. There's outsourcing of jobs. Yeah. You know, there's fear of uh, communism. Fear, yeah, fear, of, which had always been there, but fear of communism, I think, for a while actually helped the labor movement because it was seen as like, hey, we're not well, doing communism. Right. Yeah. Let's <laughs> let them have this so that we don't have communism. You know? Yeah. But it's fear. But if you think of the Cold War, like, like, I guess the 80s part of the Cold War, like, that mm -hmm. would be definitely it. Yeah. 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 And obviously, Ronald Reagan, terrible <laughs> asshole. Just murdered the unions. Yeah. Um, that episode, if you want to go back in the archives, is episode eight. Damn, that's Ooh. an oldie. The yeah. right to work episode. You can listen to us as babies. Yeah, we didn't know what the fuck we were doing. <laughs> we still don't. <laughs> no. <laughs> Not like we're pros. But yeah, I guess, I mean, the whole point with, of this was labor unions, by putting on these big community events really got themselves integrated themselves into, you know, into the community and got like public support, got people on their side. We don't see that anymore. Well, in fact, we see the opposite. We see corporations trying to do that with all their fucking charity. Yep. Mm -hmm. Also, I thought this was interesting. The U.S. has over time tried to add in some bullshit to uh, obfuscate that other holiday we were talking about, May Day, International mm. Workers Day. Uh, May the 1st in most of the world is, you know, commemorating that 1890 first uh, general strike and, and international day of solidarity and all that. Right. And in uh, socialist countries and really throughout the world that that's celebrated as, you know, as real Labor Day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so to kind of get in the way of that, the U.S. has added in a couple of kind of fake U.S. holidays. Oh, okay. What's our anti-Labor Day? So we have actually two of them. In 1921, during the first Red Scare, we first observed Loyalty Day. Really on the nose. <laughs> right? <laughs> A day set aside for the reaffirmation of loyalty to the United States and for the recognition of the heritage of American freedom. Vom. Vomit. Ugh. Yeah, that sounds like shit. Yeah. Uh, Congress made it an official holiday in 1955 during the second Red Scare day. under Eisenhower. Is that still like on the books? Yeah, it's technically a thing. That's loyalty hilarious. Day. Loyalty day. Eat my butt. There's your loyalty. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Eisenhower also on in 1958 declared May 1st to also be Law Day. Okay, guys, just the dorkiest holidays. <laughs> Jesus. Yeah, it's supposed to be for American citizens to show appreciation of their liberties and for the cultivation of the respect for law that is so vital to the democratic way of life. Oh, making a jerk off motion so violently. <laughs> Ugh. Disgusting. We're all just supposed to go blow a cop that day or what? <laughs> Oh uh, yeah, apparently like the bar associations and stuff celebrate and this and like do, you know, oh. PSAs about like, oh, isn't it great to have the rule of law sort of thing, <laughs> which it's not. No, it's not. That's horrible. We, we can't let this come back. I, mm -mm. No. no. And you know, you don't really hear about it because everybody kind of sees that it's bullshit. And it's every day here in the States. <laughs> every day <laughs> is law day. Yeah. 
but that's just some of the shit they tried to do. You know, that's very Cold War stuff in the 50s. <laughs> it's horrifying. Trying to make sure we don't, you know, celebrate that godless communist May Day. <laughs> I guess let's step back. What should leftists think about Labor Day? I think we should use it as an opportunity to tell people about the cool shit the unions did. Yeah. And like, you know, do some education. Well, I've seen online in some spaces that kind of leftist takes that like Labor Day, like it's a, it's a fake Labor Day, you know, it's, it's, yeah, like, it should be May 1st. Mm -hmm. And and it's, it's, it's commercial. It's not lined up with, you know, really workers causes. It's, it's pretty bourgeois. I mean, we could take that. it back. Like, it's not good. That's yeah. That's you could say I, the same shit about Christmas, but like, just, just make a pagan y'all. That's my solution to everything. <laughs> make it pagan. Okay. Have you Labor tried Day, but pagan. pagan? <laughs> yeah. Turn that shit into a little fall solstice situation. Or no, fall <laughs> equinox. I don't know. Um, it's very close to the equinox. I'm just saying. We could do it. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I agree with you. I think taking it back is possible. I mean, I'd, I don't know. I don't want to be the group that's like, no, we shouldn't have, we shouldn't celebrate things or we shouldn't have a day off. It's like, like we said, most, you know, a lot of people don't have the day <laughs> off for one. Yeah. Yeah. And we should just push to like, make sure everybody gets that day off or just like gets more day, days off in general, mm -hmm. you know, or a four day work week, even fewer hours. Ugh, yes. And we should revive these calls that, I mean, people were championing working less and I think we should be doing that. Like, yeah, yeah. What's the, the four twenty sixty nine plan? Yes, that, that one's good. It's good for a lot of reasons. We need that one. Uh, so it's what four hours a day, twenty hours a week, and sixty nine days a year, right? Sixty nine days a year. That's no, way that too can't few. be right. That's not very no. many days. Well, fuck. I'm I'm listening to Conquest of Bread, and they're talking about like how many days you actually would have to work. Four day, four days, twenty hours max, sixty nine dollars an hour. Oh fuck, okay, that's the dollars an hour. Okay, that's fine. That's good. That's pretty too. good. Yeah, that's good. Sixty nine days a year would be pretty rad, though. <laughs> yeah, I would like that. Just chill. You just work during the summer. <laughs> that's about it. It's fine, oh, honestly. That'd be great. I guess the big contradiction here, or whatever, is we are talking about what would we fight for capitalism to kind of give us. But ultimately, I mean, what we need to do is get past capitalism, right? If we get into, into socialism, into communism, we can start organizing societies, the work that society has to do or chooses to do, right? Is the yeah. work we have to do to like survive and reproduce and save the planet. ourselves as a society, <laughs> the work we have to do to save the planet. And the work we choose to do to advance as a society and provide extra things for people and stuff, the decision, may, I just mean like the priorities are different, you know, that's Those what we need. Those are two separate is, streams, basically. Yeah. Like capitalists are never going to prioritize that. They're prioritizing making money for themselves. Like, yeah. Yeah. I guess what I was saying is that like, it's important to fight for whatever you can get right now, but yes. also have that long-term view of like. Yeah. What the future could be. Do both. Do both. <laughs> That's De Leon would say. Yeah. I think there was a De Leon connection in this, I want to say. Oh, I love that guy. It's our it's one of our Maguires. <laughs> Matthew Maguire. He was a labor activist. He's he's, you know, one of the claimants here. Uh he was the vice he was later on after this whole thing in eighteen ninety six, he was the vice presidential nominee for the Socialist Labor Party of America which was the party that was aligned with Daniel DeLeon. Oh, there's my man. Yep. Love there that guy. Uh, teaser, he will be on a future shirt that we will be selling at some point. Nice. So, yeah, we need to work less. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we should be in favor <laughs> of all holidays, more holidays, fewer days that we have to work in general. But, okay, what about the issue of the of Labor Day being like, really kind of sanitized and, and, and commercialized. And it's just, you know, cook out with your friends and go shopping without thinking of like actually celebrating and glorifying the working class as a class, not just as people doing jobs, you know? Well, I mean, we should have 
better labor history in this country. Like, I don't know any of this shit. You know why? We're not required to teach you that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, I, I thought it originated in Russia. You know, like, all this shit. Just, like, yeah. people, like, walk around thinking. And it's not their fault. They're not taught it. And mm -hmm. I think, like we were talking about earlier, it's very, we see whatever paltry rights we have now as normal and expected when there was a time when they were not. It, you're right. Like, it, it's popularly presented as like this is just how it is so this must have been how the capitalists like set it up they were nice enough to give us weekends off to give us health care benefits and <laughs> you know a high enough wage and whatever and it's like every ounce your kids being in school and not being like in a mine is <laughs> yeah. because labor unions fought for that shit like every little thing that just seems like common sense civilization now is Someone had to fight for because some asshole was trying not to do that, was trying to more cruelly exploit us, you know? I, I think there's a real effort, especially in like a very like black and white way to distance ourselves from history. You know, if you if you think about like stuff like slavery and, and just imperialism in general, there's like, well, that was back then. That's not what we do now. And it's like, yeah, I mean, that shit still goes on. It's just a, mm -hmm. it's got a different face, you know, like. I yeah, think, we still do slavery. It's in prison. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> that that's still around, guys. And like, we still do imperials, and that's for fucking sure. And like, yep. you know, we got sweatshops. We got all these horrible conditions. It's just like you don't see it. And like, I feel like that is definitely one of my takeaways here. Is um, that is not the reason, but it's definitely part of the reason this stuff gets obfuscated. Like the story of Labor Day. It's because like we don't want to see that. We don't want to talk about that. <laughs> yeah, and. I mean, who's got the time, like, to figure all this stuff out? You're, you know, part of the reason they don't want to give you a four-hour work week is because who knows what, like, that's part of the reason they were panicking so much whenever we were off during the beginning of the mm -hmm. pandemic stuff. The few You people, might start a communist podcast. Yeah, like, you know, <laughs> for those of us, like, lucky enough to have been in that situation or whatever and weren't just still churned into it all, Yeah, you know, uh, it was, what the fuck are they going to do with this time on their hands, you know? That's part of it. <laughs> I still think of that tweet where it was a guy in like the Baskin Robbins costume and he took a selfie and he's like, how the fuck am I an essential worker? <laughs> yeah. Someone said that was fake, but I'm like, just let me have it. Just let me, that's, that's too good. I mean, it's terrible, but it's very funny. It, yeah. It doesn't matter if it's fake because like there are so many instances where that, oh, yeah. where that essentially happened, you know? Oh yeah, for sure. I think too, you know, there were some hurricane activity, obviously, and I saw like photos from New York of like fucking people working for Grubhub still out there delivering food. And like you can already wow. see like these divisions of class uh -huh. pushing up against climate change. And you're just like, that's what it's going to be. It's going to be service industry folks just being crushed as they cater to other people's needs. Yeah. And that's something we can't leave out either. We don't want any of our efforts to be uh, co-opted or just like bourgeois in nature of just like, let's make things better for those of us who do get days off at all. Like, you know, we have to be fighting for the broad working class, which includes so many people who don't have like things that are considered normal, like a 40 hour work week or weekends or whatever, you know? Oh yeah. Or they get scheduled for 39 hours. Exactly. So they yeah. don't have to pay them a salary. Uh huh. I guess going back to the Labor Day question, uh, one thing we could try doing is having more organizations openly doing shit in their communities, like a broad celebration, not like a party event, but maybe sponsored by the party, like a you know political organization, socialist, communist, anarchist, whatever. You know, uh, putting on like community festivals and shit, like. And just saying, yeah, this is put on by the anarchists or by whoever, like whatever your organization is. I mean, people will show up to have a good time and eat food. Like, absolutely. Even if they're like, this is, these are weirdos <laughs> with weird ideas. Like, I'll steal you a hot dog. Yeah, <laughs> they, yeah. It's, I took my kid to the park and they, I don't know, they didn't indoctrinate them. They didn't kill them or anything like, or <laughs> eat start. them. So. There, you know, and maybe this is kind of counter propaganda, like everyone's saying that these people are, 
you know, uh, on Fox news or whatever, they're out there saying like how horrible Satan worshiping you are and stuff. And then <laughs> you get out and show people like, you're just someone who like likes to have a good time. They'll be a little less, you know, vehemently opposed to you. Yeah. I, th I think that definitely goes hand in hand with the larger project of mutual aid. Like, Mm -hmm. I know Dallas has some great organizations that like will give out water bottles to people whenever it's really hot. And it's like, they're not out there proselytizing. They're just like, Hey, it's hot. Here's some water, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Be seen doing good for the community. We, we come back to this a lot. I think mm -hmm. the, the brand recognition. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, you want to be the good guys doing good things. You know? Yeah, for sure. You know, more organized labor participation, wherever that's possible. I know that they're, you know, we're only a 10% unionization rate, so that's not not great. But I don't know. Ultimately, I guess we need a stronger, a more conscious working class, right? Like, we need... It's fucking... How can we do... It's just... It's dismal to look at it. It's like so <laughs> hard work to... You have to unionize. You have to organize the, the boring shit that no one likes to do. Yeah, for sure. For sure. That we don't like to do. No, I don't honest. either. <laughs> Yeah, it's overwhelming, for sure. That's what we're here to tell you to do is, if you can, <laughs> go out there and do those things. It was not know? too hard for you. Yeah, I think there's a big, like, culture of fear around it. Like, when, when I've thought about, like, workplace organizing and stuff like that, like, when I think about the concept, I'm just like, I don't know, like, what the right to workplace laws are specifically for my company because they're based somewhere else. I'm like, you know, like, there's just so much like legality behind it and there's so much fear around job insecurity that you're just like ooh like it sounds very intimidating yeah i mean this is the time to do it though during a labor shortage oh for sure you want to organize uh and honestly the only this is not legal advice by the way <laughs> yeah don't but the old adage goes that the only illegal strike is a broken strike mm, i love that you gotta you know the teachers that went on strike out in West Virginia yeah. a few years back or up in Oklahoma a few years back is none of that shit was legal. Those are wildcat strikes, but it got shit done. You know, back in the thirties and stuff, they were doing sit down strikes up in, in Flint and Detroit and stuff where they were, I mean, they were occupying factories is what they were doing and holding like uh, workers schools and stuff there. And, you know, teaching people, yeah, just doing propaganda and stuff and teaching Damn. people about, you know, socialism and communism and stuff uh, and labor amazing. organizing from these like GM factories and stuff that they had taken over. That was illegal as hell, but they did it, you know, and I guess we have to get back to, and this, this is why I say it's the perfect time to when they did, when they really like can't afford to fire you as easily. They'll still, mm -hmm. fire, I mean, like they will still fire They'll you. They'll still do it. Yeah. But you have a better chance, I think. Yeah. And I think it's it's very hard in the current climate to be able to sniff out like sympathizers at work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I have a very hard time doing it just because we've been trained culturally to not talk politics and stuff like that. And there's, I mean, not like a snitch culture, but like you, you don't want to give people the wrong impression about you and like there it's just really hard to figure out like who would be sympathetic to this one thing i've read is that it's what people try to do in organizing or one strategy is to seek out kind of the what like the natural leaders among your like the natural worker leaders not managers or anything but like oh, no. the people among your coworkers who people kind of gravitate toward who have some sort of like peer not the authority really kids. but yeah yeah, they're popular, but like respected and, you know, people, that sort of thing. Not any sort of actual authority or hierarchy, whatever, but they're just, you know. Maybe they've been there a long time or, yeah. Mm -hmm. And try to like soundboard with them and, and figure out if you can get them on board with the, with the basics of a union, right? Like you don't, you know, when you're d pursuing this, you don't want to like bring in any of your cool socialism or your <laughs> communism or your anarchism yeah you want to just be practical in terms of like don't you want to be paid more don't you want to work less don't you want better benefits we deserve these things this is the only way we're going to get them mm -hmm. uh, it's it's like when you're in a job for a long time or whatever you 
might get promoted and get a little bit of a bump, but the only real way to get like large amounts of money thrown your way is to either leave or threaten to leave. Yeah, no, that's, and everyone knows that too. Like that is an accepted fact. The only actual way to get real concessions from your boss isn't to ask nicely. You might get a little bit. The only real way to do it is to make his profits leave or threaten to leave. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But there you have it. That's <laughs> but anyway, that's Labor Day and how to fix it. Yeah, um, and just make a union. How hard could it be? <laughs> Why haven't we figured this one out? Oh. Uh, I, uh, and I guess that is actually, I was just saying that flippantly, but it's a good point. It's like, why haven't we figured this one out? We have, but the material conditions haven't been there, right? Like mm-hmm. we've been in this, in this decline because of those, because of the political decisions and because the, of the way the economy uh, has been moving. Yeah. I think as we see climate change is a big one, yep. as we see more of a need for us to do something radical to be around. <laughs> yeah. Uh, to have the world as we know it, as that changes, as, you know, the, like the labor shortage or whatever, I guess what I'm saying is... We could get there again. Yeah, there's a reason to believe that we can change the trajectory that we're on, not because we come up with a better idea, but because things are different. This reminds me of a listener question we got. You want to get into that? Sure, yeah. All right. This is from Gabe. Mm -hmm. And he is 17 years old and trying to learn as much leftist theory uh, before he reaches adulthood. Great job. Love it. Yes. (laughs) But he's worried that he won't be able to stay in touch with his radical side as he grows older. And do you have any tips on how to not grow into outrage fatigue? It's a great cue. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, But we were talking about this for the show. We were were Uh trying to, because we knew this was going to be a shorty. So we're like, let's throw a question in here. Mm -hmm. And um, I brought up like, there's the kind of i mean it's not really a meme it's it, it's the cultural ex- expectation of like you know you're liberal when you're young and you get conservative when you're older right, and like yeah. and now there's the memes of all like you know me at 30 like with a fucking soviet flag or something <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know? and and that's that's definitely like i was saying like that's definitely what happened to me like i mm-hmm. used to be a fucking democrat you know <laughs> same same yeah we're in the we're in the same boat there as we used to be Little Obama heads. Yeah, we got. <laughs> I guess I I dabbled in radicalism before then, but not. I, yeah. I, you know, I was in high school. I didn't know what the fuck I was, but <laughs> which is not to say that you don't. Sorry. No. That's just no. from my perspective, I was not very with it back then. <laughs> People yeah. can be. But. No, we have a lot of young listeners, and I really admire that. Like they're taking the time to listen to. Like, I mean, what is an educational like history podcast? Like, yeah. good on you. I definitely did not do that in high school. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I I just, I think it is interesting that like, like I'll hang out with friends and, and by the end of the night, we're always talking about a fucking commune. Like it just Mm -hmm. happens. And like, there is a real generational shift happening and it's tempting to say like, yeah, maybe it'll go away as I settle down or whatever. But like, I don't see that happening. You're nearly 30. Like, yeah, like I'm almost thirty. I, I think I'm settled in in being a communist, not in like I'm gonna start like being a NIMBY or something. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, it, and this is another another good uh, example of this. Is it's not like mm, generational in the sense that just like there's something weird about us, you know, <laughs> that makes us different. It's, or it's in the water, right? Or there's just <laughs> they're a all different, turning gay. There's different <laughs> culture. Communist. Or anything like that it's although culture can play a role in it but it's the world we live in i mean like it's the material have, conditions yeah we have different we're facing different things so the the the, the people who tell you oh you're going to get conservative when you get older when they got older they got more money they moved into a different social class and they had different class interests and so they became conservatives um you see like the graphs of like you know medium income and they did it by like generations and it was just it was a ridiculous disparity it was just like how like what the fuck we did not get what we were promised basically yeah <laughs> like you know you, you've seen all the stories like millennials can't buy houses and like all this shit like we just didn't have that at all yeah and you know the few of us who, the proportional few of us who did yeah i mean i bought a house <laughs> <laughs> well if you take that se- segment you know the proportional few of us who did most of them do end up conservative as they get older because they have something to defend 
That's why Marx ends the Communist Manifesto with you have nothing to lose but your chains is because it's aimed at people who are the dispossessed, right? Who are people who don't have and who need to bring about a world where they do. And that's where we all are. That's why we all think in, about communes and, and, and radically changing things is because if we don't, we just face a world where we're just ground to a pulp and set on fire by climate change. <laughs> yeah, like I just I I don't see another option at this point. Like and, and I, I you can see like the capitalists scrambling to come up with another one like oh, we'll go to space. You know? <laughs> you're yeah. like, OK, I mean, the fundamental problem is still there. Like you're just going to find a way to ruin space. <laughs> you know, like we yeah. can't just keep doing this. Yeah, it's 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 that or it's put your head in the sand and do wellness stuff or mm -hmm. you know, work life balance or whatever to ameliorate <laughs> therapy. Your, yeah. Anything Ugh. they can do to be like, it's it's fine, keep coming to work, please. There's a lot of interesting conversations right now online about like how therapy is very like liberal in that sense of it it does bring it all back to the individual and is like, you know, how can you yeah. better respond to this? And like I've had to like not call my therapist therapist out necessarily, but just like nod and ignore her sometimes. Like, because <laughs> she'll just suggest things. And I'm like, I'm talking about capitalism here. I'm not talking about like me getting involved with a nonprofit or something to assuage my guilt. Like I'm talking about like this system is fucked. <laughs> well, yeah, I do think that's just a, a difference in tools, right? So yeah, I mean, yeah. It's like, I can't think of a good analogy, but calling one sort of service person to fix something in your house when your problem is something else. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Like, there's only so much I can get into it with her, and it's fine. She's got limits. She helps me with other things. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's their role is to help you, you know, be able to cope day to day. It's like we were talking about, like, fight for what you can within the system, but also change the system. Yeah, because, like, I can't fucking... I will not have the energy and like this question alludes to burnout like you have mm -hmm. to kind of take care of yourself too you know yeah and what do you think about that about uh what was it compassion uh fatigue or what how did gabe term it outrage fatigue which, outrage oof. fatigue i seem i feel like i have a near endless capacity to be outraged about things <laughs> sometimes i'm like doing my daily news rundown mm -hmm. with abby and I'm, it's like the third day in a row that I'm talking about just some bullshit that we were pulling somewhere. And I'm like, I'm still pissed about this. And she's just like, I don't, I don't really want to hear that story anymore. Move on, please. <laughs> yeah. I, I get that way with Kyle. Like I'll be like, I was really, you know, pissed about the abortion bill and I was going on about it. He's like, yeah, we'll be fine. Like he literally said, True, yeah. we'll take a fucking vacation if we have to, you know, wow. <laughs> like, yeah. But like, that's not the option. That's not an option for most people. And like, that's, that's what gets me is that like, I personally will probably be fine from climate change because like, I'm financially well off. And like, I personally would be fine from like X, Y, and Z because I'm financially well off. But like, so many people won't and I'm not okay with that. Mm, I don't know. I, I don't know how to help someone in that, uh, avoid that situation because... There's a lot to be outraged about. Like, you're not wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You you should be, you should pretty, well, you, but you, I don't know, you, maybe you can't function constantly outraged. Like, I think you have to have some boundaries. I think you have to, like, definitely don't get in a point where, like, it's affecting your health slash mental health mm -hmm. to a point where you can't take care of yourself. Like, that's not good for anybody. Yeah. Like, you shouldn't have to suffer and add extra suffering for that. But I think yeah. what helps with that, for me at least, is to know that I'm at least kind of trying. And like my way of trying is yelling into a microphone once a week. But sure. <laughs> but it's something. And then like when we make our mutual aid like payments and stuff like that, like it's small things, but it's it's something. And just because you might not, hopefully you will, we might not <laughs> see the fruition see the victory over capitalism in our lifetime yeah i kind of don't count on it <laughs> Fuck. even if we don't make it to that point even if you don't make it to that point it doesn't mean we shouldn't f put our bodies to the wheel of the fight like we should yeah push for it and you know we need to be even if it's a despairing contest like we do need to be waging the battle. I mean, we need to be doing what we can, wherever we can, even if we're losing nine times out of 10, because people like are suffering. You were setting the stage for that larger 
change hopefully yeah. but i mean it is scary like i i get climate anxiety a lot like i you know even when we have a conversation about like when to have kids and stuff i'm like dude i don't know if they're gonna make it <laughs> like that's fucking terrifying to think about you know like i mean we got some some time but not as much as we used to yeah i'm well you're very optimistic i'm optimistic that humans technically i mean like will survive their very you know species are very good at surviving things in general mm -hmm. especially when i mean like we can live in all sorts of climate we're you know yeah we're fucking super freaks. adaptable so <laughs> it, I, yeah i mean but the collapse of like the world as we know it that's that's actually a very viable uh, yeah i mean i was watching a a documentary on like mass extinction and i think it was like these like frogs or something are the only things to survive i'm like well maybe we'll all just be frog people <laughs> <laughs> sorry this is not a helpful answer <laughs> Hey, don't worry, dude. Maybe you'll be a frog person. I I have a like a pessimistic optimism, which I don't think is helpful for most people. But like uh it's essentially even if the world has objectively no meaning, right? If our existence is just we're spinning on a rock and it's just out there and whatever, we were just an accident in a lab or something. Uh, my point <laughs> is if if everything is completely like doomed or what have you. I'm still like, yeah, but I'm ultimately I'm going to make my own meaning in the world. So I'm going to choose to do what I think is significant, which is trying to help people win a better world for themselves, which I, I understand is not helpful for most people, I think, because it's like they get kind of gloomed out by the first part. <laughs> the first half of that is rough. But to me, the first part is liberating because it's like, whatever, that doesn't matter. I get to decide. I understand most people aren't like that, but that's how I roll. I kind of get that from like, oddly enough, a religious perspective, mm -hmm. because I think growing up Catholic, that is very much like a transactional kind of nature of existence. Like you do good, you go to heaven, you do bad, you go to hell. Yeah. And I think when I came to an age where I was like, I don't know about that, you, your meaning of life kind of changes. You're like, I'm not doing this for X, Y, Z. I'm doing this because it's the right thing to do. And I'm doing this because I want to. And like, you really do have to like make your own meaning out of that if you're mm -hmm. like atheist or agnostic or not in that tradition yeah so i i would kind of liken it to that as like yeah you do have to find your own meaning and you have to navigate that as best you can and i think to so go back to the point of how to stay because we just said like it just depends on your class but let's say <laughs> you do uh grow up and become you know very prosperous and stuff and you even end up in the top one percent or something like that you know on the show we talk about you know lennon came from you know a, a bourgeois background we, we've had ba uh, class traders a lot right? of class trader and Engels famously his you know family they're they're factory owners and stuff oh yeah yeah how, how will we protect you gabe if you how can you protect <laughs> yourself from the corruption of moving up in your in your class station or maybe you're already there i don't know what would you say you know what's what's the tip there i think for me it's empathy mm -hmm. like you just always have to be thinking about other people and like what they're going through you know like i i keep i i'm like that picture is burned into my brain of the poor fucking doordash employee or whatever it was mm -hmm. like someone had to do that like because yeah some rich person really wanted like a pizza or whatever. Someone had to go brave like ridiculous floods to get their shitty tip. I think it helps to like still have interactions with people like of different classes and not just like transactional ones of like, thanks for the pizza, slam the door. <laughs> right. <laughs> but like, you know, being like, like my husband is a bartender. So like, I know a lot of service industry people and I see the struggles they go through like with healthcare and like with pay and all this shit. And I, and it's just, it just reminds me that like, wow, not everyone has reliable days off. Like even scheduling a fucking date night with my husband takes like all week, <laughs> you know, <Yeah>. just like <laughs> shit like that. And like, that's kind of small potatoes, but like, I think it's important to just cultivate that empathy by not like in a gross, like creepy way of like, Hey, will you be my working class let me, friend? Yeah. But... <laughs> let me collect a menagerie of working class friends. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like that's not cool, but just being aware of those issues and, and not making assumptions about how everyone else's life works. 
Yeah, and I think in that vein of, of staying in touch with that community, the online community can be helpful too. Go join up with uh, the communist and the socialist and the anarchist subreddits or whatever other, I'm a Reddit person. I'm, I'm Instagram, uh, but it's a, cool. a lurker, I don't post, but <laughs> go in there, you know, you can get a lot of good, a lot of good information that really helps me in my research and stuff. And part of how we grow as people and everything is what information we're intaking and what interactions we're having with people. So like you said, with interacting with different people physically also do that online too, you know, for sure. I think it is very tempting just to want to turn it off sometimes. Like, <laughs> true. <laughs> like yeah. I was thinking other day, like, what if uh, we we're talking about people like no one wants to sell their labor to be exploited? I'm like, mm -hmm. God, what if you did though? What if you're super horny for it? Like, <laughs> <laughs> well, I, yeah, then you'd be an anarcho capitalist. I mean, you'd be yeah, one yeah. of those don't tread on me, bros. Yeah, it it is. Sometimes it is super tempting. Just be like, it'll be fine. I'm gonna be personally fine. I can turn this part off and just go about my day and do whatever the fuck I want. So I get it. Which that's, I don't know. I, I'm not going to judge anyone. It's neither good nor bad to do that, I guess. But like, it's, I guess it's fine to turn off for a little while, take a vacation, you know, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Not saying that. You don't have to be constantly at the... You just want to, you fight. don't want to tune all the way out. Yeah, you don't want to feel like you're not a part of it anymore. And that's, I guess the thing is, you have to feel like your team is the working class. Like you, mm -hmm. regardless of your station, that's who you're fighting for. Even if you win the lottery tomorrow, you know? Yeah. Yeah. If you start reading headlines and you're like, I don't know, Amazon seems like they're doing the right thing here. Maybe take a step back. <laughs> yeah. And your point about like empathy, I think is a big deal too. You know, you've got to, like you said, you've got to feel like you're on that team. I've said it on the show before that quote from Eugene Debs, about being, you know, of the working class, you know, when there's a soul in prison, I'm not free. You've got to see yourself and really conceive of yourself as the same, you know, you, the same as other people. I mean, you are a human being. We're all of this species together and the worst of us and the best of us, we're the same. Like we are just these mortal little things, you know, and you where you are in life where you get in life there's so much of it that's just up to chance i mean i think a huge part of this is reading and not just like necessarily theory i think reading a lot of like autobiographical stuff by people like i'm big into autobio comics and like that is such a intense way to view somebody's life and just be like well that's what they're going through and like mm -hmm. you know fiction works for this too because you are imagining yourself in somebody else's place and like i think having the this a strong ability to do both those things is very helpful because even though yeah we are in the same struggle we also all have different struggles and i think like mm, yeah. making space for differences too is also nice yeah that's a good point i was emphasizing the similarities but you're right yeah we are also living wildly different situations all the time yeah you gotta be a little intersectional about it true okay i hope that was helpful <laughs> we kind of rambled a lot about existence and shit. <laughs> we did get into, yeah. <laughs> what if we made him feel worse and now he's like, oh, fuck, what, I got to make my own meeting. <laughs> Sorry, Gabe. You, you know, Sorry, it's Gabe. also fine not to know, you know, and like, especially, you know, you're where 17, you're at in life, you got time. <laughs> things are, yeah, things are really open-ended uh, and that's good and you'll get there. Yeah, man. You, you, don't, you never have to actually settle down and figure things out. They just happen. People tell you, you got to have this like roadmap for everything. And you like, you don't, you can. Yeah. Every adult you look at and you're like, that's an adult. They're a different thing than me. No, they don't fucking know. No. Yeah. We They're just ended up just here. Swimming around blindly. Yeah. It was a series of days and now I'm here. Like it, I never grew up one day or anything like that. So it's, I don't know. I feel like when you're a kid, you get kind of sold a bunch of stuff about your future or whatever, you know? Yeah. Yep, they try to shove you in a life track very quickly so they can sell you more stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yep. That was a good convo. Let's wrap it up. All right, yeah. Let's uh, talk about Do we? what are we doing next week? Yeah, what are we doing next week? Next week, we'll be hitting part two of the Socialist Republic of Vietnam. Last time we left off when Vietnam 
got its independence from France after the First Indochina War. We'll be talking about uh, the Vietnam War and Vietnam's trajectory after that. Cool. Well, I'm going to go back and listen to that episode if you want to. That's just two episodes back. Uh, check that out. If you want to become a Patreon person, I guess a patron, is that what it's called? Anyway. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> if you want to become a patron on Patreon, uh, you can go to uh, patreon.com slash teach me communism. And for five bucks a month, you get access to our notes. So this week you'll get the Labor Day notes, um, but you can also look at the backlog. So if you want to review for Vietnam, not like we're going to give you a quiz or anything, but we might, we might, we could do that. Pop quiz. <laughs> Oh, no. <laughs> that means I'll have to take it because we can't get listeners yeah, on the air. They'll just so play fuck. along and you'll be, you'll be <sighs> the, the real dummy. One. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I've definitely got to re-listen now. Also, if you get on Patreon, you get a sneak peek at some upcoming merch. Finally getting around to designing t-shirts. So, yeah. Hell yeah. They're pretty cool. I've seen them. They're cool. Thank you. I'm pretty happy with them. I knocked <laughs> them out in like a day. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> We're still taking suggestions for those. If you think of any cool catchphrases from the pod that you're like, <laughs> we definitely need that on a shirt, let us know. You can reach out to us on social. We are on Instagram at Teach Me Communism, Twitter at Teach Communism. You can send us an email, teachmecommunism at gmail.com. You can send us episode suggestions or questions. Um, Just sometimes praise. people ask for sources. Yeah, praise is always encouraged and loved. Fashion advice. I won't be able to help with that, but. <laughs> I will. I will help you. Yeah. <laughs> and also, you should leave us a review on Apple Podcast. It really helps people find the show, and it makes us feel good. Yeah, it's great. It's a, it's a way to do, a small way to do your part for the worker <laughs> struggle, you know? Get the message Absolutely. out there. Um, yeah, recommend to a friend, you know? See, sniff them out. Be like, hey, I have this podcast. You want to listen to it? Are you cool? Uh, <laughs> if they come back and they're like, that was horrible, then sorry. That was unfair. That was bias, bias, bias. <laughs> that comment always cracks me up. <laughs> it's the name. Like, oh, sorry. It's just so funny. All right. Thank you for this lovely conversation. Yeah. Hopefully you learned a bit about Labor Day and how we can make it even better. I did. I'm, maybe <laughs> I'll start taking off May 1st. Fuck it. That would be a good way to... <laughs> Just like everyone if, take off. So if we start popularizing that, we would start to be able to see who like, who's the, who are the real heads, you know, like who's cool. Oh yeah. Just, oh, like, how would you do Would you just be like, yeah, I'm taking off May 1st. And like, you know, explain it. And they're just like, right. oh, cool. Like, do you have a vacation? You're like, no. <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 And you no just kind of make that a thing that people kind of mention in their mm -hmm. work. Oh, I'm taking on May 1st. Me too. Oh, yeah. cool. <laughs> Weird. It's just a little code amongst ourselves, you know? I like it. A little secret organizing. We're Gotta do the secret club. Yeah, that's step one. So. Obviously. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Cool. Uh, and thank you, uh, you listeners out there. You guys are awesome. Love y'all. Uh, tune in next week for another episode of Teach Me Communism, where the class struggle is always in session. Bye. Goodbye.